you and I are busy communicating through a device that you are very familiar with, uh, which can see. Uh, it, is, it is registering light waves just as our retina do, and it's transducing them uh, into signals, uh, which are then transmitted across uh, the oceans in, in the case of this conversation. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, received by a device on your end of the pond. Um, and, uh, and none of that requires the conscious experience of redness or blue. Following is my conversation with Mark Soames. Mark is a world-renowned uh, neuroscientist, uh, also uh, a world-renowned uh, psychoanalyst. He published this wonderful book, The Hidden Spring, where he introduces his theory or journey rather uh, on the theory of consciousness. And his approach is that the basis of consciousness, the source of it is not in the neocortex. It is coming from the deep circuits of brain and it's more subcortical and the, the basis, the fundamental ingredient of it is affect, which is intrinsically conscious. Cortical processing is not intrinsically conscious. This is part one of my conversation with Mark. Uh, hopefully you're gonna enjoy it a lot and uh, there will be more uh, episodes uh, as we continue on this journey. Uh, Mark and I, we are making sure that we don't shortchange any discussion and we give a proper time. Okay, and without any further ado, here is my conversation with none other than Mark Soms. Okay, so we are on, sir. Mark, how are you doing, sir, today? Very well, thank you. I'm, I'm talking to you from Berlin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, Mark, I and a lot of members of our audience are such a big fan of your book, uh, The Hidden Spring. And it is such a wonderful title as well that, you know, uh, everybody who uh, starts thinking about consciousness, starts thinking about vision and cortical functions, and you take us back in time and say, well, you know, things started a long time ago before cortex appeared on the evolutionary stage. So we are so excited to uh, have this conversation today. So hopefully it would be a, a multi-part conversation along the way. So tell me, Mark, what is your sort of thinking today of what uh, we are going to talk about? And then one request that I have is at the beginning, uh, let's talk about uh, Jock Panksepp and then any other uh, colleagues whose work have influenced you and the people that you are still collaborating with. So with that, sir, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so you say I've gone um, uh, uh, backwards in time uh, uh, from cortex uh, to more primitive brain structures, and that's true. Um, the I, I, I didn't do that for a priori reasons. It's not that I had any reason to believe um, that uh, the cortex is not the place to start. What I did, however, think from the outset is that we shouldn't start with human consciousness as our model example um, of what consciousness is. Human consciousness is, of course, the most complex form uh, in nature. And generally, if you're trying to solve a problem, you don't start uh, at the most complex uh, end of the spectrum, but rather you try to reduce things to their elements. Um, and so uh, uh, that was why I was interested in looking at, at simpler forms of consciousness than human consciousness. And um, it was Jak Panksepp uh, who, um, more than any other neuroscientist, was studying consciousness in, in simpler brains than human brains. And it really was a very great surprise to me to learn from him and through his work uh, that where the action is, as it were, um, in terms of uh, where 
basic uh, forms of consciousness are generated um, are in the brain stem. Uh, you know, I, I would have thought, um, I, I, you know, before I became acquainted with his work, I would have thought, well, all mammals at least must be conscious. They've all got cortex. So let's look at the, you know, at simpler mammals than ourselves and try to uh, try to tackle the problem that way. I didn't think that we would be going down to the brain stem. Um, so that was, as I say, a big surprise. It wasn't um, where I uh, expected to go, but the evidence that Yak uh, um, drew to my attention was so overwhelming um, that it was necessary to follow his lead. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's quite a difficult step to take because the tradition um, in neuroscience that the cortex is the organ of consciousness goes all the way back at least to the 19th century. So um, you set yourself up uh, uh, in opposition to your colleagues once you take that step. And, uh, and that's never an entirely pleasant uh, experience. But as I said, the evidence was so overwhelming that um, I found I had to follow him uh, to that conclusion. No, no, that's that, that's that's uh, so spot on. And then I think uh, a lot of colleagues like uh, and Antonio Damasio and others, uh, in some fashion, hold that same point of view that that you hold based upon your research that. Uh, it all starts in it all starts in brainstem and uh, uh, so no totally uh, totally with you on that and uh, it's such a fresh perspective on that and I think there's a lot of attention uh, to it. I, I just want to say one further uh, preliminary remark about what you just said. Um, Antonio Damasio, <clears throat> he uh, his great contribution. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, and also it was a courageous step, was to say we mustn't focus so much on cognition, we must look at emotion, um, that this is a very important part of how the brain works. Um, but he did not start by focusing on the brainstem, he started by focusing on emotion. And it's to his, that was a, that was a great contribution. But it is to his very great credit, uh, Damasio's, that in subsequent years, after the 1990s, uh, he recognized that these emotions are generated in the brain stem. And so he took a double leap, you know, first of all, from cognition to, to affect, and then secondly, from, from cortex to brain stem. Um, uh, and... Uh, the, uh, so I need, I need to give credit to him too uh, for, for the, the influence that he's had on my work. So I gather you'd like me to go through, I'm gonna pull up some slides um, and I'll go through my story. M my starting point uh, is this um, famous statement by David Chalmers uh, of the hard problem, as he called it. Um, he said, how can we explain why there is something it is like to entertain a mental image or experience an emotion. It's widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of how and why it so arises. That's the hard problem. And uh, it centers on this statement of something it is like. You know, why is there and how does it happen that there's something it is like to be this physical thing called the brain. And uh, the, the phrase, something it is like, which is a sort of definitional statement of what we mean by a conscious thing. A conscious thing is a thing that it is something it is like to be. Uh, derives from the work of, a, of another philosopher, uh, Tom Nagel, who said an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it is like to be that organism something it's like for the organism. So he went on to say, Nagel did, uh, if we acknowledge that a physical theory of mind must account for the subjective character of experience, we must admit that no presently available conception gives us a clue 
about how this could be done. So, uh, as I said, this is my starting point, and my yeah. aim is to give us a clue. Uh, nothing more than that, but to give us a clue about how we might uh, begin to understand how experience arises from uh, physical processes. Yeah. So here's the problem. Uh, here's the hard problem. Uh, let's be clear about what it is. Why and how is there something it's like to be an organism? Something it's like for the organism. One thing, Mark, that I'll just quickly share with you is one question that came from the audience who have read your book. Uh, this question has come from more than one person and related to this point that we are on right now. So you uh, take us through a journey in your book to demystify, take mystery bit by bit away and closer to the closer to the answer. Some people have said that on the question of why and how that your book and your thesis does a wonderful job explaining the why of the experience, all the qualitative states and valence and why it and how it helps with the homeostasis, the control system of the site. This, if we are a cybernetic organism, uh, some people say, well, can you maybe in today's conversation elaborate a little bit upon the how that, what is the mechanism by which we feel that experience? So uh, our audience thinks that the question that you have really nailed the why and but on how you know they would love to in as this conversation progresses hear more from you on that are we all like since it's all cells and you know experiencer and experience probably experiencer is the same thing as experience and it is like we are all you know i, I am sort of in my own software so hence to me, and, it, and it's all self-talking. And as a result, to me, it feels like that, okay, I'm having this experience because I am also part of that experience. Uh, but that is just a uh, comment on my part. Uh, so anyways, back to you on that in this conversation, uh, as you talk about the why and the how, uh, people would love to hear more from you on the how, the mechanism part, which in your opinion is a good candidate or candidates that gives rise to the experience. Well, um, that's um, good to know uh, th that uh, your audience is more persuaded uh, by uh, what I have to say about the why than what I have to say about the how. Uh, so I will, I will uh, focus my attentions accordingly. I have to say that the why question is rather easier to answer yeah. than the how question. And that is what and everybody is saying too, that why is easy, how is the difficult one? Yes. Well, one of the reasons that why is easy is as with all um, such uh, evolutionary biological stories, you know, you can, you can come up with many plausible stories as to why consciousness evolved. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's easy in a sense uh, for that reason, because it's harder to prove you wrong. Um, when it comes to how, uh, I think that's the more difficult question to yes. answer, precisely because um, what it implies, uh, if I may um, quote the, the, the great uh, physicist Richard Feynman, uh, he said, in fact, it was written on his blackboard. When he died, it was found written on his blackboard. A statement, something like uh, this. He said, um, if I can't create it, I don't understand it. So the how question, uh, if you are seriously going to claim, I know how consciousness is generated uh, from... Uh, component parts which are in themselves not conscious, um, then you should be able to uh, 
demonstrated by constructing such, uh, such a, a, a system. And uh, I think that is the final uh, test of any theory uh, of how consciousness arises. Uh, you, should, you should, if you really have a mechanistic causal explanation of how consciousness arises, you should be able to engineer it. So that's where we'll end uh, in, in my, uh, in my um, taking you through this journey, um, bearing in mind that today we have limited time, so we, yeah. we might not get to that end in this yeah. session, uh, but we'll see how far we go. But that's, I promise your audience, that's where we'll end. <laughs> Okay, um, and and I, I I should also say I I do believe uh, that in my book uh, maybe it's not as clear and not as persuasive, but I do believe that I have set out an answer to the how question uh, with the caveat that I mentioned uh, earlier that it is a clue. In other words, I don't believe that I've worked out every last detail of how to produce consciousness from its component parts. But I do think that uh, I'm, I'm roughly on the right track. And it's only in the process of actually trying to instantiate those principles, those broad brushstrokes uh, in an actual artificial consciousness that the details are going to be worked out. So uh, the truth is we have not, I and my team working on this uh, matter, have not yet resolved the, the details, but we're making splendid progress. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm pleased to tell you. So, so, so let's proceed. This, this on the screen is the, is the problem, or it's one way of putting the problem. This is the way that Nagel put the problem at the outset. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the problem uh, upon which uh, Chalmers uh, uh, based, based his own formulation. Now, Chalmers has a particular emphasis, uh, a particular way of uh, uh, formulating this problem, uh, which has to do with, with, with functionalism. He says the methods of cognitive science are well suited for this sort of explanation, that is to say, specifying the mechanism that can perform the function. He says cognitive science is well suited for specifying the mechanism that can perform the function. And so it's well suited to the easy problems of consciousness. He says, by contrast, the hard problem is hard precisely because it is not a problem about the performance of functions. He says, the problem persists even when the performance of all the relevant functions is explained. What makes the hard problem hard and almost unique is that it goes beyond problems about the performance of functions. You see this note, that even when we've explained the performance of all the cognitive and behavioral functions in the vicinity of experience, there may still remain a further unanswered question. Why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? A simple explanation of the functions leaves this question open. Why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner field? So this is a very, a big statement. He's saying that the standard approach to cognitive neuroscience, which is that when we're trying to understand how the brain generates language and memory and perception and, and action and executive control and so on, all we need to do is understand the functional mechanism. In other words, all we need to do is what we do with everything else um, in medicine and, and indeed in, in, in science. Um, specify the mechanism, uh, and then you can engineer it, and then you can produce it. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but he says consciousness is special. Uh, it can't be reduced to functional mechanistic explanations. In other words, consciousness somehow exists outside of the ordinary, or, or not exists outside of, but perhaps exists, but certainly, um, certainly it, it cannot be tackled. Uh, with the ordinary tools that we use in, in, in natural science. Uh, it seems that the ordinary tools don't, don't apply. Um, 
And to give you a, a clear sense of the gravity of the issue at stake here, um, I want to tell you in a simplified form uh, about Frank Jackson, another philosopher, about his knowledge problem, uh, which, which Chalmers builds on in this argument. Uh, in, in Frank Jackson's knowledge argument, uh, he asks us to imagine a visual neuroscientist named Mary, uh, who, and this is the simplified part of it, uh, who's born blind. Uh, she knows everything there is uh, to know about the functional mechanisms of vision. Uh, in other words, she knows uh, how uh, the photosensitive cells in the retina uh, transduce light waves uh, into nerve impulses um, and how those impulses are propagated via the lateral geniculate body to the occipital cortex and how there um, the uh, visual information is processed in multiple parallel streams uh, or modules uh, and, and how this uh, accounts for the various functional aspects of vision. But remember, Mary is blind. Now Jackson asks us to imagine uh, what would occur if one day, thanks be to God, Mary is suddenly uh, bestowed uh, the gift of sight. And she now, for the very first time, actually sees. Uh, Jackson's point is that at that moment, she will learn something utterly new about vision. She will learn something that her mechanistic understanding of its, uh, of its uh, uh, functional organization never prepared her for, never predicted, uh, namely what redness is like, uh, what the actual qualitative experiential feel of, of, of seeing is like. And Jackson's point is, therefore, uh, that qualitative experiential stuff the actual stuff of conscious seeing uh, is somehow uh, is not accounted for by the functional mechanisms. It seems to require yeah. some other kind of approach. It seems to exist in some other kind of realm. Uh, so I want to be clear again, what he's saying is that Mary will learn something utterly new, her, her, her comprehensive knowledge of its functional yeah. mechanisms uh, didn't, didn't prepare her for or predict what it is like to see. And, and, and this is, as I say, gives a, gives a, a, a good sense of the gravity uh, of the problem that we are tackling here. One thing, Mark, so, there is a question from audience, even on, on this specific point. I uh, totally agree with you on that even if I, in my head, now I'm trying to ask this question on behalf of this person, uh, if I, even I, in my head, as a conscious mind, hopefully, simulate that I have never experienced color, uh, but I am a neuroscientist uh, working on the neural pathways of color and function and behavior. And my colleagues in this imagined experiment like you are describing to me who actually can experience color that in language, what is it to feel and experience color? But when I actually will experience color, I would still learn something new. Even as a lay person, I can totally uh, see that the question that this person or a comment uh, this person makes is, in mathematics, we have these uh, things that are orthogonal to each other, real numbers, imaginary numbers and whatnot. Uh, there are similar structures in quantum mechanics as well. Uh, so it looks like that these qualia, they are very different from each other the experience of seeing is very different from experience of hearing and experience of touch and so on and so forth. And language does not do an adequate job explaining uh, the, what is the redness of the red light that no matter how hard I try in English language, I would not be able to communicate that experience until and unless somebody feels that experience. Uh, but this person makes this comment that people who have this sense blending, some kind of synesthesia going on, and they experience you know, one sort of sensation as other, they hear colors or you know, they see images for what they hear and stuff like that. 
the question is, is it possible in some rich languages to bridge this gap? And the gap is in English, you try to communicate to me, I'm sure there is this beautiful redness of red. And I would say, okay, I get it. But when I actually experience it, I say, the words did not do an adequate job explaining or communicating that qualia. But this person asked, is it possible that down the road, uh, uh, explaining one sense or sensory experience with another sensory experience or through some richness in the language itself, will this gap shrink? The answer is that the problem as posed by Nagel and uh, Jackson and Chalmers and all these philosophers of that ilk is not one of, of the limitations of language. In other words, it's not a matter that functional mechanistic accounts do not describe consciousness adequately. Uh, they're saying that they do not explain why consciousness arises at all. Yeah. And they uh, and they do not prepare, they do not provide any explanation as to why it should occur either. And that's a very important yeah. point because um, the, the visual mechanisms understood by Mary, um, they, they do not require there to be an experiential something it is likeness for them to perform that very same functional mechanism. That functional, and, and, and perhaps to illustrate the point, um, let me draw your attention to the fact that you and I are busy communicating through a device that you are very familiar with, uh, which can see. Uh, it, is, it is registering light waves just as our retinae do, and it's transducing them uh, into signals, uh, which are then transmitted across uh, the oceans in, in the case of this conversation, um, and, uh, and, and uh, received by a device on your end of the pond. Um, and, uh, and none of that requires the conscious experience of redness or blueness. Uh, the, the, unless you're going to claim that the internet uh, experiences things, um, it's, yeah. it, it, we have to conclude that it is possible to see, in other words, to register and transmit and decode um, visual information without there being anything it is like to do that. And yeah. that is the point they're making. So it's really more a point about um, an explanatory gap uh, uh, as the philosopher Levine calls it, an epistemic gap uh, that the one way of doing science, you know, which is to explain the mechanism, uh, doesn't have anything to say. It's not that it can't describe in sufficiently sophisticated terms, it's that it does not speak to uh, the issue of why is there something it is like at all uh, to, 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 to see because it's because seeing can happen without there being something it is like um, and that is exactly where i'm going in my little summary yeah. um so i want to say you know so here's a here's a, a flow chart of what goes on uh, in the visual cortex by the way it's no accident uh, that jackson talks about a visual neuroscientist the main focus of our attempt to understand uh, what has come to be known as the Neural Correlates of Consciousness, NCC, uh, a, a program, uh, a scientific program that began with the work of Sir Francis Crick uh, in the 1990s. Uh, Crick not unreasonably said, well, if we're wanting to tackle the problem of consciousness scientifically, uh, let's break it down into its component parts. Uh, consciousness has all these different aspects, but let's just take one, let's take vision. Uh, why? Well, first of all, because our consciousness is dominated by vision. Uh, if, you, if you look at your conscious experience right now, the main, the main ingredient is, is vision, um, visual qualia. And uh, the other reason why uh, is because we know a hell of a lot about vision. So, you know, let's, let's start, uh, you know, let's tackle the problem uh, where we're most likely to make progress. And, and as you can see on this little drawing of the macaque monkey, which is very similar in this respect to the human being, a very large portion of our cortex is given over to visual processing. So Crick's argument was, well, let's crack the problem of vision with the neural correlate of conscious vision 
how does conscious vision differ from unconscious vision? Uh, that was that was um, Chalmers, I mean, Crick's uh, recommendation as to how we should proceed in order to try to understand scientifically how consciousness arises. So, so, so this is why uh, we're focusing on vision. We are following in the footsteps of Crick, um, and and uh, and this has been the tradition ever since that vision has been the the main target of our attempts to crack this problem. So here you have a simplified, in inverted commas, because it's hardly simple, uh, a simplified uh, diagram, uh, a, a flow chart, if you will, of what happens you know, at the level uh, of the retina and then the lateral geniculate and then the first uh, uh, level of cortical processing in the occipital lobe. And then all these multiple uh, parallel processing streams that I alluded to earlier, you know, this is this is this is a map of how visual processing works in the cortex. Now, um, Jackson and 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 Chalmers's point is, well, you know, all of that can be done by a machine. All of that information processing can go on in the dark. So why does it feel like something to see? But that's their point, and and I have some sympathy uh, with their uh, perplexity. Because when I was a student in the 1980s, uh, in the early 1980s, I, I first started learning stuff like this, like what's on the screen here. And the, the question that occurred to me, and I don't think I'm the only one, I think we're, we're all too embarrassed to admit it. But the question that occurred to me as a, as a student was, but where is the subject that actually processes all this information? Where does it all come together? You know, uh, there's all these this this breaking up of the of the task into all of these component parts, um, but where am I in all of this? Uh, who, who does the actual seeing? And um, when I put that question to my professors those days, um, the, the, their answer was, uh, to be honest, their answer was, "Don't ask questions like that. Uh, it's it's bad for your career." These are these 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 naive questions, but you know. It's to, it's to Chalmers' credit that he asked that naive question because it embarrasses us as neuroscientists. We can't answer it. Uh, so, so that um, is one point I wanted to make. I, I have sympathy with this formulation of the problem. Uh, I think that it is a real problem. Uh, you know, when, you, when you look at this mechanistic uh, um, uh, uh, diagrammatic representation of uh, the, how the function of vision uh, is instantiated in the brain. There is nothing in there that 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 addresses what it is like to see, or indeed why there is something it is like to see. But there's something else, uh, which is that uh, I told you that the computers and and the and the internet through which uh, yours and mine are communicating with each other at the moment can process visual information unconsciously. Uh, but uh, much more uh, concerning. Uh, is the fact that so can our brains, so do our brains, not only our brains uh, in general, but also our cortex. Uh, the very cortical mechanisms that I just showed you, um, well, those were macaque monkey, but they're pretty much the same as they are in you and me. Um, the, the human cortex can process visual information without it rising to the level of consciousness. And that very seriously uh, uh, raises once again from a different uh, direction, the question as to, well, if it can do it unconsciously, then why does it ever do it consciously? Um, if, the, if those mechanisms that were um, on the last slide, uh, th those, those uh, uh, information processing uh, modules, uh, if, if those things can do their job without consciousness, then it, it, it again, you know, it really seriously raises the question, well, if it can do it without consciousness, then why does it ever do it with consciousness? And to your point, the earlier point, and how? How can exactly the same mechanism uh, do exactly the same thing, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously? The, the conscious part just seems to, just seems to, you know, be so, uh, it, 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 it's so ephemeral, you, you, you can't find it in there. Yeah. And, and I want to illustrate, uh, I want to make clear what I mean when I say 
that the cortex can do its job, the human cortex can do its visual job unconsciously. Um, it, it, uh, there's one experiment. This is a, a, a this paper that I have on the screen here uh, by John Kilstrom. The title I have this paper. I could have shown any 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 one of many many papers reviewing the experimental evidence, uh, but this title is just so wonderful: perception without awareness of what is perceived, yeah. learning without awareness of what is learned. And then he summarizes the evidence that we can perceive without being conscious, and we can learn from the process without being conscious. Um, but I'll, I'll just cite one, one experiment which, which illustrates the main point. Um, if you take research participants and you, and you place their faces in a tachistoscope, um, which is an instrument which flashes visual uh, stimuli uh, at, at, a, at an extremely fast rate, so that just for a few milliseconds, uh, visual information is, is presented to the research participant. They, uh, we call it zero prime. Uh, the, the, uh, we find the level where the participant has no experience at all. You say, did you see something? They say, no, nothing at all. Uh, then at that point, we say, okay, we've reached, uh, we've reached the point where there's no longer visual consciousness. And then you present to those participants a face, let's call it face A, underneath which is written rapist, subliminally for a few milliseconds. And then you present face B, under which is written philanthropist. Now, remember, they have consciously experienced nothing, uh, but yeah. we know objectively the information has been presented to their brains. Uh, and then after the, after the, sub, the subliminal uh, perception through the tachistoscope, you then show supraliminally those same two faces uh, to the research participants, and you ask them which one they prefer, face A or face B. And it's called a forced choice paradigm. They have to, they have to express a preference. With, with a very high degree of statistical significance, they prefer face B. So there uh, is objective evidence uh, that they have seen this face um, and uh, they have read that word, uh, which by the way, are cortical processes, face recognition and, and, and word uh, reading with comprehension, a word, it's a uniquely human capacity, a cortical capacity. Um, and they've associated the word with the face, committed both of those things to memory, and that's influenced their subsequent behavior. So they've clearly done the highest level of visual information processing that the human visual cortex is capable of, um, and they've done it all unconsciously. So where does the consciousness fit in? What does the consciousness do? Uh, that's the question uh, that um, I think is a very legitimate one. It is a very so, good one. Mark, one other question I think that is relevant for this specific point that we are on is uh, somebody, uh, another uh, colleague asked this question that what is your point of view on uh, all of our uh, global neuronal workspace uh, theory friends, uh, uh, the cash and the hand and bars where they say, well, it, you know, from a simplest, layman perspective that it takes a bit for you know some of that stuff to gain the momentary fame and different parts of the network have to talk and only when uh, you reach a certain threshold then things cross the barrier of becoming conscious but below that we are not consciously aware so this person asked that what is sort of your thinking on or point of view or, or a quick comment on the whole uh, GNW, the global neuronal workspace. And there are quite a few models and variations, but they all speak to kind of the same thing. This what Danet calls the fame in the brain, brain moment. Over to you, sir, your comments on that. Well, uh, let's, start with, um, let's start with the first step in all of this, where uh, if you're going to uh, uh, claim as, do bars and uh, Dehan and Nakash uh, that these very fast uh, uh, presentation of stimuli to posterior, that is to say to perceptual cortices, do not ignite the global workspace. Um, then uh, uh, that, at this level, uh, I agree with them. I would say, fine. So let me make a point about which I and they will agree, which is that we're therefore looking in the wrong place. 
Okay, so if we're, if we're wanting to, if the visual cortex can do all of its processing unconsciously, uh, then it's a very bad place to be seeking the neural correlate of consciousness. Um, so that's the first point that I've been trying to build up to, um, is that um, uh, the, the, the experimental evidence uh, that I've just uh, uh, referred to via one illustrative example uh, is that you can do cortical visual, uh, human level cortical visual information processing without it being conscious. Therefore, it's a bad place to start. And I therefore think um, the point that Jackson and, and Chalmers make um, is a valid one, but it's only valid when it comes to vision, which can be performed, cortical vision, which can be performed unconsciously. So that leads us to the global workspace. Um, when I asked my professors uh, when I was a kid, uh, when I was a student, um, so where is the sentient subject that perceives all this information? Where does it all come together? Well, uh, the answer that Bars and, and Dehan and Nakash give is in the prefrontal cortex. That's where it all comes together. Um, and uh, actually, uh, this is also what those of my professors who were willing to answer my question after telling me I shouldn't ask such a question, and that's more or less what, what they said. Uh, look, uh, these are... These are uh, elementary information process, uh, processes that occur uh, in perceptual cortices, and then they are re-represented uh, at the level of the prefrontal lobes. That's where it all comes together. So now um, we have a standard method in behavioral neuroscience, which is that if you're going to claim that a certain uh, part of the brain performs a certain function, then uh, damage to that part of the brain should, um, should remove that function. Not so. That's the ABCs yeah. of behavioral neuroscience. So what happens if you remove the prefrontal cortex? According to the global workspace theory, um, you should only have this unconscious information process and there shouldn't be a sentient subject there who's receiving it all because the global workspace for them is the subject, you know, that, yeah. that is, it's the, so um, it's not very common to have patients with totally obliterated uh, prefrontal cortex, but they do exist. Here's one such patient is a patient of mine. Uh, I, I, I call him patient W. Um, and as a result of a, a complex uh, series of unfortunate events, uh, which I can go into if you want me to, but it starts with the subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which needed to be clipped surgically, which meant his frontal lobes had to be retracted, uh, not clipped, sorry, wrapped with muscle because of the area that it was in. Uh, this was done, uh, so it's you know, banging in the frontal lobes about, you, you, you remove the frontal bone, uh, you lift the frontal lobes, uh, you make the surgical intervention down there, which is where the aneurysm was, um, and uh, in this guy's case, it led to infection. Uh, and the infection wasn't recognized. And by the time that it was, it was really quite serious sepsis. Uh, and uh, then, they, then they tried to treat it with antibiotics and it didn't work. And you know, eventually they, they removed the bone flap and, and, and literally scraped uh, the, 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 the uh, empyema off the surface of the cortex and so on and so on. It was a disaster. Uh, the, 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 the end result was what you see on the screen here. The guy has no prefrontal cortex. He has an intact brain stem. He has intact posterior cortex, but the prefrontal lobes are gone. Now, very significantly, he has a little bit of language cortex here. So he's able to report on his experience. So here was a wonderful opportunity to test directly in the simplest possible way uh, the prediction arising from the global workspace theory, uh, the theory that the prefrontal cortex is where the sentient subject resides. Uh, I asked him, uh, I asked him, are you consciously aware of your thoughts? And he said, yes, of course I am. I said, in order to confirm that, I'm going to ask you to solve a problem that will require you to consciously picture the situation in your mind. He says, okay. I say to him, imagine that you have two dogs and one chicken. He says, okay. I say, do you see them in your mind's eye? He says, yes. I say, now tell me how many legs do you see in total? And you can see that's the critical test. He has to now look with his 
look at his visual cortex, as it were. Uh, he has to he has to look at this image, uh, and it's not an everyday question. You know, how many legs are there when you look at two dogs and one chicken? So he wouldn't have a pre-prepared answer for that. He has to actually, you know, perform the task. So you can imagine. And I thought, well, this is an excellent test of whether there's a sentient subject there that's re-representing the visual information in a conscious workspace. Um, and so you can imagine my disappointment when his answer came back as eight, uh, you know, because two dogs and one chicken, uh, they, they, they have 10 legs in total. So I said eight, and he said, yes, the dogs ate the chicken. Uh, so <laughs> this is a, perhaps not the best joke in the world, but, you know, it shows there's somebody home that there he is looking at this picture um, in his mind's eye and, uh, and, and, and possibly even actually imagining the dogs eating the chicken. I don't know, uh, but it requires conscious uh, you know, uh, cognition uh, of the kind that you would expect uh, should not be uh, present uh, in a case with no prefrontal cortex, if that's where the action is, um, where, where the sentient self Comes, it comes into being. Um, I want to draw your attention to another thing about this patient of mine, uh, which is, which is re becomes relevant as I proceed with my story. Uh, namely, that he was a very emotional chap. Uh, he was, he was hyper emotional. Uh, and in fact, this tendency to tell jokes is part, it's, it's a commonly recognized part of the, um, uh, of the frontal lobe syndrome, a, a tendency to, uh, in German, they call it Witzelsucht, uh, that they just love to tell jokes. But sadly, they don't only love to tell jokes, they also swear like troopers uh, and can be very aggressive uh, and, and have terrible mood swings and so on. Um, so why I'm telling you all of this is because uh, it's not only conscious cognition that is supposed to be generated in the prefrontal cortex, but, but affect too. Um, some very respected neuroscientists, indeed affective neuroscientists like Joseph Ledoux, uh, argue that uh, the subcortical processing of affective information is unconscious until it is read out by prefrontal cortex in the global workspace. So just as they say about vision, so they say about affect, uh, that it is only generated as an affect when, when it is when it is uh, uh, processed at the prefrontal, where, when it is re-represented at the prefrontal cortical level. Now, if that were the case, uh, then damage to prefrontal cortex should lead to less affective consciousness, not more, uh, but the, the, the routine observation is, it's not just in my patient, the routine observation in patients with damage to, with loss of frontal cortical tissue is that they are they are hyper-affected, hyper-emotional. They have disinhibited emotionality. So how can it be that the cortex is generating them uh, if when you have less cortex, you have more, you have more emotion? So um, I don't think the, the claim that the prefrontal cortex uh, is where the sentient subject resides uh, is, 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 um, is, 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 Creditable is is sustainable. Yeah. Uh, so there, I have I have partly uh, 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 I think answered uh, the question posed by uh, your your the member of your audience about well you know isn't it that the, these tachistoscopic studies don't then they, they don't provide a sufficiently sustained signal for it to ignite the global workspace? These patients, this patient that I've just described to you, yeah. he only has perceptual cortex. He doesn't have prefrontal yeah. cortex. One and other question, is. Mark, that uh, is, uh, sorry, that is uh, relevant to this point from another uh, member of the audience is on case one uh, with respect to patient W. Uh, the question is that the neuroscience technology of today here in January of 2022 when you when you you know uh, interact with patients like patient W, uh, and when they are uh, doing this report out to you, is it possible with today's technology to see which part of their 
brain circuits are active and then between uh, cortex and uh, deep circuit, subcortical circuits, is it possible to draw neural pathways or circuits and say, okay, right now patient W or Amjad is expressing this behavior and we can see that these are the circuits that are active and while it's not causality, probably it is more correlation. So the question is, is it possible with a little bit more precision or is it just what fMRI can only do? Uh, so that question is more on the technology to draw uh, with more precision the circuit or different pathways involved when you are looking at somebody like a patient W. Yes, uh, so we have in fact done uh, with this patient, we've done fMRI studies and diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, so we have a very good knowledge about which parts of his brain uh, are activated by um, visual experience and uh, by visual, Im visual imagination. Um, there, there, in fact, a, an interesting surprise came up when we were studying him from that point of view. Uh, namely that he's got, he's got considerable degeneration of the, uh, of the tracts leading to the hippocampus and indeed uh, uh, to, to the hippocampus itself, uh, the afferent uh, 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 pathways to the hippocampus. So, so uh, that was a surprise and uh, there's all kinds of ways in which one can uh, interpret that, but it's, it's, it certainly wasn't what we had expected. But what, what the main finding uh, is that his visual cortices are, of course, intact and are, of course, what he predominantly utilizes uh, in order to both see consciously and to imagine consciously. In other words, he's using the same cortex um, as you and I do. Uh, we use it in addition to our prefrontal cortex. He does it without prefrontal cortex. Now, there's also activation in the superior colliculi, which is in the brain stem. And there's also activation of the reticular activating system. Uh, and I'll come back to those things later. Uh, uh, but uh, nothing other than the hippocampal uh, thing, nothing surprising came to light from the study uh, of this case um, uh, with diffusion uh, tensor imaging and, and fMRI. Um, but because the, of the question that was asked earlier, I want to draw attention um, to the fact that I had a debate with uh, a representative of the uh, global workspace uh, or neuronal workspace, global neuronal workspace theory. Uh, and that was Lionel Nakash. Uh, we debated all of these issues online. Uh, and then we also uh, had a, um, a, a debate in a, a written forum. Um, there's a Journal of Consciousness Studies, which is actually where Chalmers originally published um, the, the, the paper about the hard problem. Um, in the latest issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies, in other words, the last issue of 2021, uh, there's a, a dialogue between me and Nakash addressing these questions. So, um, the I've said uh, on the basis of my first case, uh, and of course, it's not only on the basis of one case, I'm just illustrating the sort of data uh, that calls the theory into question, that the prefrontal cortex is the, uh, is the seat of, of, the, of the sentient subject. Um, the other major uh, theory in cognitive neuroscience today um, is associated with the name of Bud Craig, uh, and he claims that the self comes to mind in the insula, uh, and, and perhaps uh, in the anterior third of the insula in particular. And um, this is one of the reasons why I mentioned affect earlier. Um, it's, it's because Bud Craig's point of view, which I think is, is, a, is a good one uh, in part, is that this, the sentient subject comes about through a registering of its own, the state of its own body. Uh, the own body is, 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 is monitored uh, in the brain uh, and the state of how I'm doing here and now um, is monitored at the cortical level. It's monitored at, in the insula. 
And so uh, assuming that the cortex is the organ of the mind, uh, Bud Craig says, well, then uh, at the, at the uh, level of the insula, the most rudimentary representation of a self uh, occurs. Namely, you know, just the feeling of the state of the, that physical thing that is you, uh, to, 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 to feel it from within, um, is in, in Bud Craig's uh, view, the origin of the self. So uh, just as with my patient W, um, we, we, we need a case uh, where there's no insula. Again, it's not common to have, uh, to have a discrete lesion bilaterally uh, uh, that totally obliterates the insula, but it does happen. Here's one such case. This is a case of my colleague Antonio Damasio, um, who as a result of a, of a viral encephalitis, uh, herpes simplex encephalitis, uh, his, his, his insulae were destroyed, totally, totally destroyed bilaterally. Um, and so just as I uh, uh, conversed with my patient W, um, Damasio did the same with his patient B. He, he said, do you have a sense of self? The patient says, yes, I do. He says, what if I were to tell you you're not here right now? He'd say, you're blind and deaf. Uh, what, do you think other people can control your thoughts? No. Uh, why isn't that possible? Well, it's because you control your own mind, hopefully. Uh, Damasio says, what if I were to tell you that your mind was the mind of somebody else? The patient says, well, when was the transplant? Uh, the brain transplant. Damasio says, what if I were to tell you that I know you better than you know yourself? The patient says, I would think you're wrong. Uh, please note, the patient keeps saying, I, I would think you're wrong. Damasio says, what if I were to tell you that you're aware that I'm aware? The patient says, I would say you're right. Damasio says, you're aware that I'm aware? The patient says, I'm aware that you're aware that I'm aware. So again, uh, I think even on the basis of this most simple uh, test uh, of the prediction arising from the hypothesis that the insula is where the self uh, resides, uh, it's, it's uh, thoroughly disconfirmed uh, by cases like this. Um, this patient clearly has an I, there's a me there, uh, there's yeah. somebody home, it feels like something to be patient B. And, uh, so, you know, the, it, it, the, 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 the prefrontal lobes is not where you and I come into being, um, and the insula is not where you and I come into being. And I need again to mention affect. Um, patient B, uh, uh, Damasio makes much of this in his published report of this case. Patient B doesn't only feel affect, bodily affects like pain, uh, the, the need to urinate, sleepiness, uh, but also emotional affects, you know, like loneliness and anger um, and fear. Uh, not only does patient B have these feelings, he has them excessively. He's, he's dominated by feelings. Uh, he's unable to inhibit and, 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 and contain his feelings. So again, that's a very interesting observation, I think even more so in the case of the insula, because uh, Craig's whole claim was that uh, it's the feeling of the state of the body at the level of the cortical insula uh, that the self comes into being. Uh, and uh, it, it clearly that's not the case because he has a self without any insula, but also here is a self who's got excessive feelings. So the feelings can't be generated in the insula either. Uh, so where are they generated? Well, the obvious argument against the material I've presented to you so far is that these patients have lots of cortex left. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, patient W, um, maybe functions that would normally be performed by the prefrontal lobes, in his case, are being performed by the parietal lobes. Um, maybe in the case of patient B, functions that are normally performed by the insula are performed by somewhere else, uh, the prefrontal cortex or, you know. So the only way to get around that, um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, objection is to say, well, what happens in cases where, there, where there's, entire, there's no cortex at all? Um, you know, if, if, if we're going to claim that the cortex 
um, is the seat of consciousness, uh, then let's see what happens when there's no cortex. Now, um, there is a problem here, uh, namely that if there's no cortex, uh, then there's no language area, uh, then the patient can't tell us what it's like to be there. But nevertheless, you know, we can make observations. Um, if there's no cortex, uh, and if the cortex is the seat of consciousness, then perhaps you might predict these patients would fall into a coma, which is something you can see from the outside. Um, or at the very least, you would predict that they would, that they would succumb to uh, what we call a vegetative state, uh, also known as non-responsive wakefulness. In other words, they're not in a coma, but they're totally non-responsive. So that's what you would expect if the cortical theory of consciousness is correct. And so here we look at the case, uh, a, a little girl with no cortex at all. Uh, the, the, this condition is called hydranencephaly, which means uh, cerebrospinal fluid water, you know, hydra, hydra, uh, cerebrospinal fluid instead of encephalon, instead of cerebrum instead of cortex. And in fact, this girl doesn't have any forebrain at all. She doesn't even have basal ganglia and thalamus. Uh, so these kids vary, uh, but the defining feature is that they don't have cortex. The brain stem is intact. I, I said earlier that the superior colliculi also process in visual information. That's part of the brain stem, but they process it unconsciously. Um, and uh, that's how blind sight works. The, these patients receive information, even though they have no visual cortex and therefore no visual consciousness, nevertheless, they still receive visual information. So this child receives information, not only from vision, but from all of her special senses, uh, but there's no, uh, there's no cortex. So the conscious part of the processing of that uh, uh, sensory information is gone. Uh, now, for me, the important thing is, is the sentient self gone? Uh, is this, this, the, the actual uh, basic subject that, that me and I, the what it is like to be uh, a person? Uh, is there something it's like to be this girl? Uh, and the answer, I think, is pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, dramatically yes. Here she is. As you can see, she's awake. She wakes up in the morning. She goes to sleep at night. Uh, in fact, this kid also has absence seizures, which are brief moments of loss of consciousness and even her parents can recognize they say she's she's with the fairies and she's back again so they see with sleep and with wakefulness with seizures and and recovery from seizures the the, the absence and presence of consciousness um, as the wakeful state um, but remember what i said about uh, the about the vegetative state it is non-responsive wakefulness so wakefulness um, is not uh, the only criterion, it's responsiveness. And here you see yeah. how the girl responds when her baby brother is placed on her lap. She goes, ah, oh. she likes it. Yeah. Um, she can't tell us in words that she likes it, but yeah. she shows us by her behavior and her facial expression uh, that she's pleased by this uh, event of which she cannot have any thoughts there's no cortical representation, uh, yeah. no possibility of a cortical representation of what's going on. But she has affects. There's, 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 there's evidence of a raw feeling being expressed by this child. And she's not the only one. They're all like that. Here's another child. Well, not all, uh, but, but pretty much all of these kids. Um, you know, they show not only wakefulness, but emotional responsiveness and a wide range of emotions. Uh, here's a summary by, Mer by Merker, Jan Merker, um, of his observations of many such cases. They show a wide range of emotions. Uh, and uh, importantly, most importantly, in, in this thing down here, that they show those emotions in situationally appropriate ways. Yeah. In other words, uh, when you tickle them, they giggle. When you... Uh, 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 clap your hands uh, unexpectedly, they startle. Um, when you frustrate them, uh, they arch their backs and, and complain, uh, and so on. So they show uh, uh, emotional responses to stimuli which they're perceptually unconscious of, cannot possibly be perceptually conscious of, but they have emotional consciousness and emotional responsivity 
alongside wakefulness. So um, on the basis of this sort of evidence, uh, I think, again, I say it, we've been looking in the wrong place. If we're yeah. trying to identify the neural correlate of consciousness, uh, the, then, then it's not in the cortex. Uh, there's, there's, um, there's no region of the cortex which, when lesioned, leads to a loss of sentient being. Uh, and uh, when the whole of the cortex is removed, there still is evidence uh, of the preservation of sentient being. There is something it is like to be those little girls I just showed you. And it so, is very clear, um, Mark, it is very clear by looking at these pictures that there is definitely somebody home. That is how, you know, it comes across uh, to uh, me looking at it. Since our audience have heard you in your other uh, lectures and they have seen those pictures, uh, same, same thing. One sort of, you know, question and uh, uh, that many people have asked that for these little kids, what is their day-to-day -day life like if there is anything you are able to share since there is such a deep human story and connection here. Uh, so a lot of people are just interested in that for them and for their loved ones, what is their day-to-day -day life like? What is it that they can or cannot do? And it's and the, the, uh, uh, the reason behind these questions is not scientific or any, it's purely human uh, to understand uh, that there is definitely a person there, there is somebody home there, that uh, uh, what is their life like? My answer to that question uh, starts from a very uh, um, sad fact, which is that it depends on how you treat them in very large measure. And why I say that's a sad fact, it's because we used to believe that these kids were unconscious. Uh, it's purely on the basis of the cortical theory of consciousness, and therefore we treated them as if they were unconscious. Um, and so they were severely neglected. And I don't mean this as a criticism of anybody. It was, it was what we knew those days. So we treated them as if they were unconscious. Uh, in other words, we didn't interact with them emotionally at all. Um, and they were treated like, if I can just use a Kind of popular image that everybody understands the Romanian orphans uh, mm -hmm. those were kids with perfectly normal brains uh, but they were neglected to the to the point that they became extremely withdrawn unresponsive uh, creatures and uh, so that's how these children used to respond uh, until we started to uh, not generate the self-fulfilling prophecy so children who whose parents uh, did not want them to be institutionalized, but wanted to care for them at home, um, started to observe you know, th this emotional responsiveness. And uh, initially, uh, the, the doctors uh, that they were uh, dealing with, uh, and I've seen this sort of thing many times, you know, they, they think, oh, well, you know, the parents, they want the child, they believe the child is responsive and so on. But then, you know, to his great credit, somebody named Dave Schumann, a pediatric neurologist, uh, on hearing all these things from the children's parents uh, who were caring for these kids at home, um, he, he, he took the trouble to go and observe for himself and noticed that it's absolutely the case that these kids are remarkably more responsive uh, than you expect uh, than on the basis of the old information that we had. And, uh, and Merker... Uh, did the same in, in, a, in a much larger study, uh, observed these kids. So the answer is, uh, first of all, it depends what kind of context, what kind of environment they have. Secondly, it depends also on, on how severely uh, 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 damaged their brains are. It varies. Some have only uh, loss of cortex. Uh, some have the loss of cortex and the loss of brains, uh, the basal ganglia, uh, and, and thalamus in the forebrain nuclei. Why that's important is because uh, those, those structures are very important for learning, uh, unconscious learning. So um, where Merkur says here uh, that they appear to enjoy specific tunes and specific toys and videos, and that they come to expect the regular presence of such things in the course of their daily routines, that's the result of learning. But that applies only to the kids who've got some subcortical basal ganglia uh, intact. Those who don't, they don't learn. Um, but even, even those uh, who have only cortex that's missing, 
Uh, I don't want uh, our audience to get the wrong impression. These kids are very disabled. You know, they really are very disabled. They, they, they have a significantly impaired uh, movement. Um, they, 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 they can't walk. Uh, they, they, they live in wheelchairs. Uh, but you take them, as, as I described in my book, you take them in their wheelchairs to Disney World and they have fun. You know, they like it. Um, they, they, they enjoy uh, the entertainment. They enjoy the sights and sounds. Uh, they enjoy the soda pop and the ice cream, you know, and so on. So they, they, like, they like little babies, um, if I can put it in a, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, they, they never really grow up. Uh, they remain very responsive, but at a very rudimentary level. Uh, and they have extremely impaired motor abilities, sensory abilities, and uh, intellectual abilities. The, the, the only claim that I'm making is that there is something it is like to be these kids yeah. because they have feelings. Um, and totally. uh, uh, that, that's, that's the important point. So we'll, we'll take it from there next time when we meet again. Uh, I think this is a good point for us. This to is a good, sto time. good stopping point. And uh, thank you, thank you, Mark, for uh, our, this first part of our conversation and uh, to be continued, sir. Thanks, Amjad. I look forward to it.